Coming up, a one-on-one -on -one interview with Mark Baggage. How does he see his path to victory in a three-way race that splits his traditional constituency of rural and moderate voters ahead? How Mark Baggage plans to navigate to November 6th. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come. Bringing you the faces, the places, and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to Frontiers for part two of our election series on the governor's race. We've already had our sit down with Governor Bill Walker and you can watch that program online on the Frontiers section of KTVA.com. And just so you know, it's not for the lack of trying. The Republican candidate, Mike Dunleavy, has not accepted our invitation to join us for Frontiers. His campaign told us his schedule is too busy, despite our attempts to work with Mike Dunleavy to find alternative said times. But that said, Mark Baggage has accepted our invitation and joins us now. He's the Democrat in a three-way battle for victory. So. Let's start off by pointing out one thing that of the three candidates, you know, yours is perhaps the more distinct position. Mm -hmm. And you are listing very far uh, to the left side of the equation in terms of positions, not so much the conservative. Traditionally, I've seen you be more of a moderate. Mm -hmm. I would say this first, Rhonda, thanks for this opportunity. It's always good to be on shows like this because you actually get to have a little more in depth instead of 15 second answers on everything. <laughs> right. I, I've noticed during the campaign, everything gets shorter and shorter and shorter and you have to be quick, 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 but uh, I appreciate it. I think our, you know, my positions, uh, you know, are what they are. You know, I, I support Stand for Salmon. Uh, I think it's an important proposition. I'm pro-choice when it comes to the issue of reproductive rights for women, but I also believe in a good fiscal plan. I've laid out a comprehensive plan when it comes to the permanent fund and how to make sure it's balanced, sustainable, and the dividend is constitutionally protected, but also protecting education. I've laid out a pretty comprehensive plan on crime, but you know, this election is kind of unique in a lot of ways. We have three candidates that are different in their views. And that's kind of unusual too, because right. usually candidates often have a lot of similarities. Right. They kind of meld into the same, you know, box you might say, but in this one, it's, it's very different. You know, we've gone out there, I've gone out across the state talking to people about the issues that matter and what you hear all the time is education and crime and the permanent fund and what's going to happen with the budget long term and, and growing the economy beyond just oil and gas. People want to talk about fisheries and transportation and tourism, all the issues that help us define who we are as a state. So it's kind of an interesting discussion. It's a dynamic definitely that's different. That, that's right. But maybe to help people, you know, we did sure. say that, that these candidates are each defined differently. Right. So maybe one way to make the distinction is to start off by talking about what your top priorities are. Sure. So can you summarize what your top three priorities would be yeah. if I'd you say, were elected? I'd say uh, there's always more than three, but the three... Oh, there's you know, lots. Lots, right, especially <laughs> with the state government. But I think people are very concerned about crime in this state, and it doesn't matter where you go anymore. I see, you know, down in June, I was down there, and you never really heard about the crime issue, but it is definitely on the forefront of people's minds. Or you go out to rural Alaska, or you go to urban Alaska, it's a top issue. You know, my experience of being mayor of Anchorage and how to combat crime, I think, will be very helpful in dealing with this on a statewide level. The other issue is education. You know, we're now number 46 in the nation when it comes to education compared to 50 states. We have to do better in this arena. We have to get ourselves back on the top if we want to retain our young people to stay here. But also, a growing economy in a great state has a great educational system. And the third is, in my view, is you got to look at this longer term issue of how you diversify this economy the right way. What I mean by that is, we talk a lot about oil and gas. We talk about mining. We talk about, to some extent, still timber. But these are the kind of things people love to talk about. But really, when you think about it, transportation, fisheries, tourism, healthcare, fastest growing industry in the state, but yet it takes you two years to just get signed up to get into a nursing program when you know 
the minute you graduate from that program, you'll get a job like that. So we have to kind of reinvent the way we deliver our services so we can employ people in these new fields. And then you take it even one step further. I've seen this incredible entrepreneurship growing in Alaska. It doesn't matter if it's people developing unmanned aircraft in a small way in Alaska or new technologies. All this or renewable energy, all that is another piece of the equation. And then, of course, those are the three. Then the one that kind of overshadows everything that you want to get out of the way right away. And as you must deal with this budget on a sustainable way. The way they have it set up now is all they'll be do doing is debating the amount of the dividend every single year. Well, I want to talk about the dividend sure. since, since you brought it up because it is one of the big defining issues of the campaign. When Bill Walker made the decision to cap the earnings, uh, or rather cap the dividend, cap the to dividend. tap the earnings right. to pay for government, I mean, he really it appears, didn't have any better options. I mean, what would you have done oh. if you had been in that situation? Yeah, I, I think there were better options, but first what let me say, well, first let me, let me first say this. You know, you think of rural Alaska. You know, when you think of some of the coastal villages where the average income for an individual is eleven to $15,000, maybe $20,000 per annum per year, and you knock out the dividend, it has a direct impact. I mean, what that decision was, was to take from the least in order to solve a problem to the budget and never do a real fiscal plan. Here's what I would have done. If they would have done what I did when I was mayor, when I was mayor, we were, before I came in the office, they were spending one-time money to plug the budget gap. The net result of that is you never solve your problem. So we stopped doing that right when I came in, forced some tough decisions on what services we're gonna have, what fees are gonna be charged, what taxes are gonna be paid, and then we made it sustainable. If the governor would have just said, on the constitutional budget reserve, $14 billion was in that amount, in that fund. They would have just taken that money, put it into the corpus of the dividend. The earnings off of that alone would have plugged almost all the gap that exists today. But they didn't do it because it was easy money. They spent it. And the governor will blame the legislature, and the legislature blames the governor. Well, they both a party. You know, one spent it, one didn't veto it. He should have vetoed it. But you, you would have the same problem. You yeah, but dealing well, you with a legislature I, that won't uh, dance. <laughs> well, sometimes you got to help them dance and bring them to the dance. And that's what I would have done is made it very clear, as I did when I was mayor with the assembly. I told them, if you bring me a budget using one-time money, I will veto it. They didn't bring me a budget with one-time money. They brought me a budget that was sustainable, ongoing revenue stream. The governor had that option. And if you look at some of his comments, he says, he says that is his biggest regret. Well, the biggest regret is we're all going to have to pay for that now. So the better approach would have been put that money aside. But we are where we are now. So here's what you got to do. First thing, you know, the Dunleavy plan on the permanent fund doesn't uh, sustain itself. It doesn't inflation prove it. Basically, over time, you'll lose your dividend and you won't have money in the budget. The governor's plan leaves it in the hands of politicians to decide every year, which they haven't done such a great job. So what I would do is I take a chunk of the money that's in the reserve right now, put it into the corpus of the fund. The second thing I would do is use the percent of market value, the formula, but I'd put it into the Constitution. 50% going to a constitutionally guaranteed dividend, so only the public can change that. The other half, education, frees up money within the budget. Instead of using it for education, now you can use it for the rest of the budget and you'll still have a gap, and we're going to have to have some revenues to fill it. But that's how you do it. All right. Well, we'll take a break now. Coming up, as we continue our conversation with Mark Baggage, we'll try to get a sense of just what a Baggage administration would look like. Welcome back. As with almost every election in Alaska, there are so many unknowns, especially this one. It's a three-way race, and those have always had a different set of dynamics, but this one does appear to be very different. And Mark, I want to talk about that. Sure. Uh, a lot of people have said that it is impossible, impossible for you and Governor Walker to win this race because... Alaska has a majority of conservative voters. Well, actually, independent voters is the majority, but That's the next right. biggest block are Republicans. Mm -hmm. And so the two of you are set to split a pot of rural and native voters. So how do you see well, a path to victory? I, I, I would say this, Ron. I mean, uh, almost half of the governors that have been elected in this state have been Democrats, the other half Republicans. This is a state that votes for individuals. When I won my Senate race statewide, they voted for John McCain for president and Sarah Palin. So people do split voting. That happens all the time. In this kind of race, 
you know, I believe you need to get about 38, 40 percent to win this election. Uh, I see the pathway. I think we are talking a lot about the future of Alaska, what's possible. The other candidates seem to be ground into just the moment and looking backwards instead of forward. And I think that's a big difference. There's a lot more younger people that are agitated, you might say, in the politics of today that are looking for something a little different than what they've heard the last four years. I think the other piece of this is the combination of voters that are out there. Uh, if you look at the municipal election just occurred here in Anchorage in April, uh, a lot of new voters entered the equation, almost 30% were new well, voters. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, uh, because in the lower 48, of course, they're talking about this blue wave, right, kind of an right. anti-Trump wave that's developing. And, and you know, I don't really, to be honest, from watching politics, see a blue wave coming to Alaska, maybe a blue trickle. Yeah. Well, Do you think your campaign will benefit from that Yeah, somewhat? I don't know we benefit. I think there is... Uh, um, well, I like to say, people say it's a blue wave, I say it's a positive wave. People are fed up with the negative politics of today. I mean, all you gotta do is watch the late night news, watch other things, and it's just negative, negative, negative. And I think people are frustrated. They want something fresh. They want something out there talking about new ideas and not just the same old grind. And I think that's what we benefit from. We have a, a we get an attraction from a lot of younger voters that come to our uh, events and want to participate in our election. I think when you look at what's going on in, the, in this country, in this state, people are frustrated. 65% of people in Alaska do not believe we're headed the right direction. So what does that mean? How do we reshape that? And I think what we're showing is this is how you, well, you know, my, one of my opponents, all they do is run negative ads all day long. This is on, on TV. This is what they do. And I think people are getting fed up with it. I think we offer this pathway of saying, look, Vote what you believe in. Vote who you think could do the best job. And at the end of the day, we believe, I believe, well, I'm this that is, candidate. This is a real interesting test of, of where the voters are. It will be because, for one, you are a supporter of Ballot Measure 1. That's right. A, a pro-choice right. candidate. The only one in the race on both those. And traditionally, Alaska has been more conservative. Well, actually not true. On the choice issue, 68% of Alaskans are pro-choice. And when you think of the issue of protecting our fisheries, I think that's a pretty popular issue. Now, how, you know, how that will play out at the end of the day is another story. But I will tell you that anyone who sits around and thinks the state is just a red state is mistaken. 56% of the people who register do not register to a party in this state because they vote for the person. But I, have have to just, I, have, I just have to go on my own experience just looking at, at people that have traditionally been Democratic, supported the Democratic candidate. And, you know, down on my street, longtime Democrat, very nice lady, mm -hmm. she's got a Walker Malott sign. So you basically, you know. You know, Rhonda, this is the split. dialogue. Yeah, you know, this is, the, and I'll be very frank with you, if that was, we got 30,000 votes in the primary alone, in the primary. I look at this race. Most of the media loves to talk about this because it's intrigue, it's politics behind the scene. But you know what people talk to me about? People, when I go out and talk to folks, they don't even bring this issue up. What they care about is what are you going to do about crime? What are you going to do about education? How are you going to grow the economy? What are you going to do to protect my dividend? This is what they care about. And people should be voting, and my hope is that they'll vote for what they believe will be the future of Alaska instead of the fear of Alaska. Too many times people sit around and think about, oh, my God, what happens if? Okay, what happens if in a positive way? That's how I've always campaigned. If that was the case, I wouldn't have been mayor in 2003. I wouldn't have beat Ted Stevens in 2008. I can go through all the times people said, don't do it. When I ran for assembly in 1988, they said, oh, you're running against the state, the city chamber leader, blah, blah, blah. And we won because we run a hard campaign and we work on the issues. You are indeed a gambler. <laughs> but and sometimes you gamble and win and sometimes you don't. But let's let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, your positions on crime, because I, sure. like you said, that is one of, of the big issues. You know, Probably the number one that I hear most about. And, and perhaps one of the things that, that heightens this is, is the death of a 10 year old Kotzebue mm -hmm. girl, mm -hmm. Ashley Johnson Barr. Right. You think this is a canary in the coal mine? I think we've been seeing this canary for the last several years. I mean, we're number one in the nation when it comes to crime. That is unacceptable. It should be unacceptable to you. It's unacceptable to me. I know it's unacceptable to a lot of people I see around uh, the communities around the state. 
And this, we, we have seen uh, this situation. I think this is highlighted in a way that's very different than I think we've seen in the last year or two. What would you do to make a difference well, to the people of Kotzebue that are now grieving over the, yeah. the loss of Ashley? Which is a sad loss. And, it's, and, you know, luckily they've been able to capture the person who's alleged to do the crime, and we'll see what happens. And hopefully if he's guilty, they'll make sure it's a tough penalty. But here is the challenge. 40 state trooper positions, fully funded right now, empty. 20 correctional positions down in Seward, fully funded, empty. Because we haven't had the administration and or the legislature focus on crime. They focus on one bill and they don't look at the big picture. For example, if someone goes into the courthouse today arrested in Anchorage and the judge says, here are your release requirements, so if you're released on the street, those aren't transferred back to the police department, so they don't even know what these people are supposed to be doing or not doing on the street. When, when I was mayor, one of the things we did, and we did it with an innovative approach, we dealt with the drug trade very harshly, and what we used is the U.S. Attorney's Office we prosecuted him instead of under state law, under federal law, because it had a much bigger impact. So you have to have I a do, comprehensive... I do want to ask you before we leave the subject of crime one more question because a lot of people think that there's there's a systemic problem and maybe one example might be the recent case with Judge Michael Corey yep, yep. Um, having to let uh, someone who's done a very violent right. assault An on assault. a woman Absolutely. get a free pass basically. Right. Yeah, I, 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 They're trying to recall that judge. Right. What's your take on yeah, that? Yeah, I think the penalty, there should have been a penalty. I mean, they'll say there was. I don't believe what I saw was a harsh enough penalty for the crime he committed. But then what you see is the elected officials respond versus step back. The system, it is a systemic problem. It has collapsed. You have problems in rural Alaska, urban Alaska. You have places that never seen crime like it has been because they have taken their eye off the ball. They haven't focused on it. What they've done is played petty politics in Juneau over a piece of legislation instead of focused on the bigger problem. On our website, you know, I'll promote it, baggage.com, a lot more detail on public safety because that's, we have to have a larger uh, answer than just, oh, we'll pass one bill and suddenly magic will happen. That's not how it works. All righty. Well, we're going to have to come to our next segment, take a break here. Coming up, we'll wrap up our conversation with Mark Baggage with a look at what kind of future he envisions for our state. It is impossible to discuss all of the issues in any campaign, even with an extended conversation like this. So sometimes it has to come down to some very simple, basic questions. Uh, Mark, before we go, one thing I want to know is, what are your fears about a Dunleavy administration and a Walker administration continuing on? Well, I think when you look at Senator Dunleavy, you know, he is not a supporter of public education. He wants to have a voucher program. He wants to take kids out of villages and put them all in boarding schools. That was one of his comments. I think when it comes to the budget, his uh, plan that he has for the permanent fund will bankrupt the state over time and your dividend will disappear. I think he has a lot of extreme views on some of these issues that I think are detrimental to the state. When I look at uh, Governor Walker, it's four years, and I look at the statistics. We're higher in crime than ever before, worse in education, highest unemployment. These are not things that the last four years has proven to be a positive for our state. And so I see a difference that people want to look longer term. They want a future, and they're concerned about where we are today. Well, they have uh, one thing, though, that the Walker administration has done is it's been more bipartisan than any that we've seen in many, many years. Well, that's after eight special sessions in the last two years. That wasn't too bipartisan. They got caught in an election year this year, and that is your, you know, the cold comment about there's no pink slips. Well, of course, it's election year. You're not going to see that. You're going to see them get out of Dodge as quick as possible because they don't want to have the heat. And the reality is the budget thing they did put the burden on the least that can afford it. That, they've been kicking, the, you know, they've been kicking uh, the working folks of the state to the corner every single year, and they did it again in a big way by the way they dealt with the dividend, instead of figuring out a long-term, stable fiscal plan. They haven't done that, no matter what they say. But historically, they never do. I mean, well, that's, legis that's, legislatures you know wait the, to the very no, and end And the reason is because the cliff. But it takes leadership from the governor's office. You know, they used to do that on the assembly every single year. Instead, we got it done in one year, and then we spent time building a city for the 21st century. 
That's what these folks should be doing down in Juneau. So many issues here that we could get into, yeah. but I want to come down to one basic one. Sure. You know, that, that old Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young song about <laughs> you know them by their dreams. Yeah. yeah. So how will we know you by your dreams? Well, I think what, what I hope, you know, when people ask me, what do you see after 10 years or so, you know, your impact that you would have as governor? You know, I want people to feel safe when they walk out their door. They're not worried about, you know, what's going to happen to their kid walking to school or going out and finding their car stolen. I wanted a safer place. I want to make sure that when people think of education, that they think of Alaska as a place that kids are thinking about the great education they're getting to prepare them for the future jobs of this economy. And third, I want to make sure that, you know, when people say, we want to have a job in this state. It's not just the same old broken record that we've heard for 20, 30 years, but it's all these new opportunities that are on the cutting edge for us. I think Alaska has incredible hope. I see it when I see these young people when I'm traveling around the state. I see it in their eyes what they see as the future of Alaska. What they're discouraged about is the leadership is void in understanding what they see. And I see young people who stay and want to be here. They don't want to leave the state. They don't want to leave their community or their village. They see opportunities, and I think a governor has to see it with them, listen to them, and then help make it happen. And that's what I want to do. I always enjoy this, this conversation I have with a, a state employee who is now retired, but I, I always ask him, well, you know, what do you think about all the different governors? And he had nicknames for their administrations, <laughs> and uh, Frank Murkowski was Bankerville, yeah. Tony Knowles was Deliland, yeah. Governor Palin was the earthquake governor, Sean Parnell was the oatmeal governor, oatmeal governor. and Bill <laughs> Walker, I asked him, I said, well, what, what, what label would you like to have? He'd like to be Bill the Builder. <laughs> So what handle would you like to have as uh, governor? Oh, that's an interesting Mark question. Mark the Gambler? No, I'd say Mark, get it done. Just what I did when I was mayor in the Senate and Assembly and all my life. You People bring me challenges. We sit down together as a community and we get it done. Mark, get it done. That's right. All right, one final topic for you is, you know, there are only there's only one person that can win that's and, usually the case <laughs> and you know the way that it's looking right now is is you know that that mike dunlavey has a distinct advantage because he has a solid block of of conservatives i mean what if you're third in this race <laughs> rhonda you're on a broken record here and that is uh well it's, today, an, it's, it's an important point but you know we show second <laughs> position right now what happens if we're third then that means we're third but we've seen most data shows us in second place at this point breathing down dunleavy's back and that is what's going to happen all the way to the end and the bottom line is what does that mean that means obviously if i'm in second or third or bill walker's is either we've lost that's what that Is there means. any chance that if you turn out to be third in the polls that you'll no, drop running, out? No, I'm running to November 6th. That's the election date. That whole story that people love to keep perpetuating out there, people have three choices. Going backwards, staying where you're at, or moving to the future. I'm moving to the future. All right, but one question for you about that is, is let's just say you don't win. You know, that your gamble in this case doesn't pay off. What's next for you? What would you do? Do what I've always done, be involved in the community at every aspect that I can, not be afraid to talk about issues, but I have a family, I have a business, nothing's changed. Serving in public office has been an opportunity to put my ideas on the table and help make change to our state or our city when I was mayor. You know, that nothing, I mean, I don't disappear. I mean, that's life is what it is. Uh, but, and I would say this, it's, you know, you use the word gamble, it's not a gamble. Gambling is going in when you think the odds are not very good. I believe the odds are very good for us to win. And the bottom line is, if people get out and vote, and the folks that we're talking to care about Alaska's future and vote for the future, then we win. All right, well, I want to thank you very much thank you. for joining us and, and being a part of this conversation. Absolutely, thank you. All righty. Three roads after November 6th, and there will just be one, in which a state may head in an entirely new direction. Be sure your voice is heard on Election Day. We want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.